Welcome to the well. You are watching The Well at New Covenant with pastors Tim and Barbara Rigdon. We hope you are blessed by today's message. Come as you are. You won't leave the same. I don't know about you, but I'm the donkey. <laughs> I'm not speaking this after others, but I'm going to encourage you to become the donkey. Now, some of you may look at things. Hallelujah. Sister Leslie prays it out every Sunday. <laughs> In there, Lord, we're just the donkey. Because God gave me a revelation some two years ago that it's been building upon and building upon. And he's gave me more revelation that I've been holding back since January to release this word for this day, for such a time as this. This is the most important message I've ever preached in 23 years. It's weighty. It's heavy, the glory of God. Because God said... This is the most important because you're going to speak the destiny of this church for the next 23 years. And so I want to speak a word that's in season. You may say, well, Pastor, we've heard you make reference. And the bad thing is that some of this has slipped out over the last four months. And I try not to release it all at one time. But I want to talk to you about the donkey. Amen. Let's read some scripture to make it official today. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1, the Passion Translation says it this way. Now... As they were approaching Jerusalem, they arrived in the place of the stables near the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent his two disciples ahead. By the way, this has absolutely nothing to do with this, but Jesus was born in the stable, so why shouldn't we be comfortable in the stable here this morning? Amen. It's good enough for him. It ought to be good enough for us. Hallelujah. But they arrived, and Jesus sent two of his disciples ahead, saying, As soon as you enter the village... You'll find a donkey tethered along with a young co- her young colt. Check this out. Untie them both. See, this is not the same way. This, is, this story is in all four translations or all four interpretations of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All four Gospels. But only here in Matthew does it say untie them both. See, because you had a mama that had a young colt. Untie them both and bring them to me. I believe this comes into play with the thing that we've been speaking out for several months now. Transgenerational move of God. Where God's not just going to pour out His Spirit on the young people. We thank God for the young people and we pray for a revival to happen in our young people on Thursday nights and and the the anointing of God to fall on Luke and Leslie and all those that help out with that and there be a revival in our young people. And we all time talking about youth revivals and youth conferences and youth gatherings and all this and youth explosions and all that. And thank God for all of them. But I'm here to proclaim to you tonight, God is going to pour out His Spirit on them young people, but He's not going to leave us old folks out either. Come on. (laughs) Jesus said, I don't want you to just bring me the young'un. I want you to bring me the mama too, the daddies. I believe God's about to pour out his spirit here like never before. That we're going to see a move of God that's not going to just encompass the young people or the children. Hallelujah. It's going to go across transgenerational lines. You're going to see your mamas, your daddies, your grandmas, your grandfathers. Hallelujah. I don't care from the from the no hair to the blue hair. Glory to God. See, there's two different generations begin to manifest here. But he said, you get, we can get them both. But the other thing is, I believe this is prophetic for the state of Kentucky. Pastor Barb's already mentioned that there's 120 counties in the state. There was 120 people in the upper room when the Holy Ghost fell. And we're talking about the Holy Ghost falling on your young and your old and all generations. Hallelujah. But right here, he says, you go and you're going to find them tethered. He says, you untie them and bring them to me. I don't know about y'all, but on my tag... On one of my vehicles, anyway, it says Kentucky Unbridled State. When I cross over, if I've been down to North Carolina to see our grandbaby or my mama and stepfather, if I come back across the line, it says, Welcome to Kentucky, an unbridled state. People don't realize that it's been prophesying that over the state of Kentucky for nearly 20 years now, and it's saying it's an untethered state. I'm telling you today, 
It's just like Jesus was crying out when he did to Lazarus. Loose him and let him go. It's time we loose a generation of young people and let's loose a generation of older people and let's realize that we can come together in every generational form and, and realize that God can move not only to us but through us. I believe God's unbridling the state of Kentucky spiritually. There's some things about to be released here within the next couple of weeks that you're going to see what God's about to release in the state of Kentucky. Hallelujah. It's not just here at the well, but it's in the state of Kentucky. We're going to have an upper room experience that's going to sweep across the state of Kentucky. Amen. Hallelujah. And here's another thing. God's about to rise up wells across the state of Kentucky. I'm not talking about the well at New Covenant. I'm talking about spiritual wells that have been dug. There's a heritage here in the spirit of here in the state of Kentucky that we have had things heaped into our wells, and some has tainted it, and some has kept it piled full. But I'm here to tell you, if you go back and that right outside of Russellville, Kentucky, glory to God, it's no accident you're here today, Brother Ricky and your father. But right outside of Russellville, Kentucky, I'm about to come down there and pray. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But I'm telling you something. There's a wellspring down there in Russellville. Amen. It's called Red River Meeting Grounds. And some years back, hallelujah, way before the Second Great Awakening, there was a communion service where the community said, we're just going to come together, and we're going to have communion together and as they begin to take communion together the Holy Ghost fell on every generation that day and God birthed something and he birthed it so strong that it went out to Cane Ridge Kentucky on the eastern northern part of the state hallelujah and they gathered there and all of a sudden what did they do they took communion there and as they took communion in other words they got relational with God they got relational with Jesus amen that all of a sudden they began to commune with the Father hallelujah that the spirit of God fell down there and 20,000 people came from all over the place driving their wagons they said that there was no microphones there was no power uh, there was no sound systems there was no tv there was no cameras there was none of that they jump up on this and that and they were just preachers jumping up all over the place why because it was nameless and it was faceless so man could not take the glory I prophesy over the state of Kentucky that's going to sweep this nation and sweep the world that we're going to be a burning bush and a sign and a wonder that God's rising up an upper room experience that he's releasing in his last days his spirit where no man can take the glory, where no church can take the glory, where no denomination can take the glory, but where God gets the glory again. Because it's God who's pouring out His Spirit. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about this church. It's not even about the state of Kentucky. It's about God's about to return with His Son, Jesus. Hallelujah. And it's time to get ready. It's time to get ready. Are you ready? Hallelujah. Woo. That stage is taller than I thought it was. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got to go on. This is my introduction. That just scared a few people. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Untie them both. And he said to him, as soon as you enter the, the village ahead of him, you're going to find a donkey's coat tethered to where he's never been ridden. A colt that's never been ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. <laughs> Untie it and bring it to me. <laughs> the thing that you've got to realize is, <laughs> that goes against common sense. <laughs> Why would Jesus say, bring me the colt? That's never been ridden. Now, Jesus, you just told us to bring his mama with us. And I bet his mama, she's broke. She's been trained. I bet she may even neck rain. That's a cowboy reference for you today. <laughs> I live for Miss Deborah. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> Can you imagine if you were the dude that owned the donkeys? You know, if you were that man that, you know, were, he, they're getting this mama and they're getting this cult that's never been written before and see when you're reading scripture it says if anyone asks you or stops you and asks what are you doing you just tell them the Lord of all needs them and he will take them but have you thought about if you own them donkeys a couple of dudes that you don't know walk up and start untying your donkeys <coughs> it's like somebody going out there and you walk outside church today and they're getting in your car <laughs> you're going you're going to be like, uh, hey, wait a second there, boy. <coughs> or girl. <coughs> Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? That's what was manifesting here in this day and age. It, they said if anybody stops, you tell them the Lord has need of it. So this, this, this keeper of the donkeys, this owner, can you imagine? And then they say, you tell them the Lord has, of all needs them, and he will let you take them. So he's like, hey, hey, 
What are you doing with my donkey? The Lord needs it. He's like, oh, okay. <clears throat> but wait. Why are you taking that one? Why are you taking that little one? That one, it ain't broke. That one, it's not trained. Why are you taking them? You say, Jesus going to ride into town on it? No, 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 no. That, that thing ain't broke. That thing going to throw him. That thing's going to buck. That thing's going to do all kinds of crazy stuff. You need to take this donkey. This donkey's been to seminary. This donkey's broke. This donkey's been trained in some of the best Bible colleges around. But yet Jesus said, no, I want the donkey that ain't been rode. I want the donkey that ain't been trained by a man. Somebody going to get that right there. I want the donkeys that ain't been trained by, the, by man. Some of y'all need to realize this. You're not going to be taught in a classroom. You're going to be taught in a throne room. You hear me? You're going to get along with the Lord. The Lord's going to... Guess what? I ain't been to Bible college. I ain't had none of that training. I got along with God, and God speaks stuff into my spirit. And he's no respecter of persons. If he speaks it to me, he can speak it to you. And I've sent, I found he's doing that. So many of you are coming up saying, the Lord said this. I said, really? That's what the Lord's been saying. To us. Yeah, and it's, it's just awesome, the confirmations that God's doing. But Jesus said, I want to choose the one that ain't been rid. The one that ain't been ridden. The one that ain't broke. The one that ain't been trained by man. <laughs> now see, this goes against our common sense thinking. This also goes against theological thinking. Because theologically we think we can't let nobody be used of God until we've trained them to be used of God. I don't know about y'all, but when I got born again, when I got saved, when the Lord come down and He set me free from drugs and alcohol and all that, there wasn't nobody trained me at that point. You know what? I just knew I was saved and I wanted everybody else to feel what I feel and knew to get what I've got. And I want to tell you what, I may not have done everything right, but I was like Romans chapter 10 verse 2 says, I had a zeal for God, but I didn't have the knowledge. I had a zeal for God, but didn't have the knowledge. The problem is a lot of us have got the knowledge and now we don't have the zeal. Say law. We have knowledge without the zeal. But I had zeal. I want to see the whole world get saved. Because I don't know about y'all, but I once was lost. But then I was found. I was blind, but then I was seeing. The world looked different. The grass was greener, the sky was bluer. Everything changed. Now I hear people talk about, say, well, I went up there and I prayed that prayer. And I, I went to church, I tried church, and nothing changed. <clears throat> That's because you repeated words. You repeated words. I want you to know that there's going to come a time in the service here that this altar is always open, but there's going to come a time in the service where we're going to invite people to come to this altar to receive the Lord. We're not inviting you to come and repeat a prayer. We're inviting you to come and have an encounter with the Lord Almighty. Because <laughs> I don't know about you, but when I had an encounter, it changed me. <laughs> when I had an encounter, I was never the same. <laughs> See, when I had an encounter, he took away those things. <laughs> when I had a true Holy Spirit encounter with God. Amen. It changed everything. I wasn't the same person. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. Because what? I had an encounter with one. And all of a sudden, it developed a relationship. See, this is not about religion today. This is about relationship. This is about a one-on-one. -on because -one. God ain't got grandchildren. I, I got a, a wonderful mother sitting here, and she brought me up in church, and I slept on more church pews growing up. Her and my dad traveled all over singing Southern Gospel. We got in here singing last night and stuff and then just worshiping the Lord. And I sat on every revival. They were the special singers on every revival. And glory to God, you know, I, I did all those things. But no matter how much she served God or how much my father served God, and still are both of them, no matter what they did, I had to have my own personal relationship. Hallelujah. Here's a side note. I was birthed in revival. I was. I was birthed in revival. See, there was two pastors, two Baptist preachers, 
got together, Ricky Mason and uh, what was his other name? Help me, Mom. He pastors New Covenant up there. Hallelujah. Uh, or did. He's the apostle over it. But these two pastors got together. They said, we're going to have a revival. And they started having this revival at this little old country church right outside of Canton, North Carolina called uh, Sunny Point Baptist Church. <clears throat> and Sunny Point Baptist Church, they started seeing people come forward and they started seeing people getting saved. <laughs> and all of a sudden, they started getting into the high schools. And all these young people started coming. And people started getting saved. And more people were getting saved. And all of a sudden, it went one week. Then it went two weeks. Then it went three weeks. Then it went four weeks. And this thing kept going. Oh, well, Mom and Dad, they were doing the special singing every night. So I was in every one of those services as a child. I was in that spirit of revival. And later in years, as uh, uh, Pastor Harvey, that's his name, <coughs> Frank Harvey. Frank Harvey, not the one that does the, the, the rest of the story. <laughs> this is the apostle. But... But, but, huh? Yeah, that's Paul. This is Frank, his brother. <laughs> but Frank Harvey, he he come for it. And later in years, when I accepted my call to ministry, the only training class I had, biblical class, I sat underneath him. And uh, he asked me, he said, "Are you related to?" And I said, "Yes." He goes, "I remember a revival." He said, "You had to be a little boy." He says, "You were on. You would sit there on the front row." I said, that was me. And he, I said, tell me what happened. How did this bust loose? And there was like four or 500 people in a town of less than 6,000 got saved. Four or 500 people in a building that wouldn't seat half of what we're seating here today. How did four or 500 people get saved in a church that wouldn't seat 100 people? He said, well, let me tell you what happened. He said, we got to praying and we'd get in there and praying. And he says, while we're there alone praying, he said, and I was laying on my face, and I said, God, I just want you more. He said, the Lord spoke to me that I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I said, really? <clears throat> so all of a sudden, he said, I, we kept praying about it, and we kept seeking it. And said, then uh, we heard about this woman, Sister Bertha Smith. And she lived in six miles South Carolina. And he said, we felt like we need to go to her because she was a uh, missionary to China. And she was literally the lady who led to the Lord, Ni Tu Shung. Now, if you don't know who Ni Tu Shung is, you ever heard of the author Watchman Ni? His real name is Ni Tu Shung. And so the woman who led Watchman Ni to the Lord, who's wrote so many, who died as a martyr, he said, she was so in tune with the Spirit of God. Said She was later in the year. She was a big lady. Her and her sister were on the front porch in Six Mile, South Carolina, stringing and breaking green beans in a rocking chair. Said she had a little white picket fence there. Said, I opened up the picket fence. It did the creak. And it says, as I started to walk in there, said her back was turned to me. She, and I heard her say to her sister, there must be them two Baptist boys that the Lord said has come today to get the Holy Ghost. He said, I didn't make it to the porch. And he said, I fell out in her yard and received the Holy Ghost right there in six miles. After. <laughs> then he took it back and stayed quiet about it. Because <laughs> the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we receive the Holy Spirit when we're saved, but the baptism of the Holy Ghost is another gear. <laughs> okay? That's a full submersion. And it says you should receive power when the Holy Ghost is coming. <laughs> power to be what? A witness. <laughs> And that power to be a witness, that's what birthed that revival. Well, guess what? God had me in that revival <clears throat> as a child. Then I, I drew away from God. I did my thing running and gunning, trying to be a rock and roll star. <laughs> and when I came out of that, I, I didn't know I was going to get some of my testimony today, but when I came out of that deal, and I came out, and I, because I'd went forward when I was about eight or nine years old, and I repeated the prayer, and I got dunked in water, and everybody cried, because <clears throat> I knew I didn't want to go to hell. And that was awesome. But in later years, I realized I needed more than just fire insurance. I needed a relationship with it. And as that came upon me on my 22nd birthday, 
I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And that's when God changed some things in my life. Guess what? I get saved. I get born again. I'm on fire for God. And I'm, I'm in East Fort Missionary Baptist Church. And I'm so excited about God and what God's doing that all of a sudden my pastor at the time, Brother Johnny Foster, I love the man. He says, I'm called to preach this. They've called me to preach a, a, a little revival over the weekend over here in uh, Robbinsville, North Carolina. Now, if you don't know where Robbinsville, North Carolina is, that don't surprise me at all. Because if you've ever been there, you were lost. <laughs> you can't get there from here. You okay? It's on top of a mountain there. It's actually the home of Ronnie Millsap. That's where he was raised up. I actually, later in years in preaching, I got to preach in the church that he was raised up in and got to uh, pray over his grandmother that raised him and stuff. She fell in the Holy Ghost. It was awesome. But, there, but here's the thing. There, we're sitting there. And he says, you want to come with me to revival? I said, sure. I haven't been saved six weeks. And so I take this old guitar my mom bought me. And we go out there, and I've been writing some songs. And he'd get me up every night to sing a song. <clears throat> and I'd sing a special for him, something that God had put on my heart to write. And this, all of a sudden, here it happened again. This weekend revival Went into a week, and people started getting saved all the place. <laughs> Next thing you know, he said, hey, you want to go into the school? <laughs> We're going to get, they've given us the opportunity to go into high school and invite the high school to come to church. I said, let's do it. So all of a sudden, here again, was in this little Baptist church that didn't see the 100 plus people. <laughs> And people were lining up outside because they couldn't get in the building. They were sitting on their cars and trucks to hear the gospel. And the power of God would fall and people were getting saved and hundreds were coming to Jesus so much that they shut the high school down for two days because they were laid out praying before the Lord. <laughs> I'm saying that to say this. <laughs> I believe God's about to do something again and I know he didn't give me a glimpse of that and he didn't sow that into my heart so that I couldn't experience it at where I could understand it at a greater magnitude and I believe there's an outpouring of the Holy Ghost about to happen over this city, over this region, over this county, over this the Kentucky and I said, God, I want to be a part of it. I don't have to be preaching. I don't have to be singing. I just want to be there, God. I just want to be in your presence. I don't want to lead it. I want to be led by your spirit. And I want you to do what you want to do. God birthed me in revival. He brought me through revival. Even when I was that young colt that didn't know nothing about nothing. When I was unbridled, hallelujah, though, it released something inside of me. I'm here to tell you that there are folks here, you've never done anything from God. You may say, well, I've only been saved a little bit of time. You're that young colt that God's about to ride in on if God can save me and deliver me if God can use me he can save deliver and use you <clears throat> who are you to discredit the anointing of God that God wants to place upon your life who are we to say that the grace of God is not enough who are we to say that the blood of Jesus is not enough who are we to say that the anointing of God is not enough you have disqualified yourselves for ministry because you've, you said, I lack experience. But yet Jesus says, you qualify because you're the one I'm going to ride in on this town. Yeah. I'm going to ride in on you. Well, Tim, you were just laid out as a little boy in revival. And then later in years, you weren't born again but a few weeks when you were, when you were plunged into revival. But God's about to plunge us into revival one more time. Come on. We're about to see some things happen that goes past what we think can manifest. See, when you go into Scripture here, He took both generations. He took the one that didn't have any experience. He took the one that didn't know what to do. I couldn't quote you Scripture. All I could do is tell you my story. Somebody needs to catch that. Some of you waiting to be with somebody to witness to them Till you can quote all the scripture. Just tell them your story. <clears throat> your story is unique. Let me let you in on a secret. Your story is anointed. <clears throat> Do you know you didn't have to be on drugs and alcohol and set free for your story to be great? You could have served God all your life. It's still a great story. 
My wife was saved at 12 years old, laid out on the altar so long crying out to Jesus to save her that they, her mom wasn't even at church and lived down the road. They went to get her, her mama and her sister and her other sisters and her brother-in-law and they came to the church because she'd been laying on the altar for hours, 12 years old laying before the Lord and they went and got their mamas and their brothers and sisters and brother-in-laws and guess what? Their mama and the sisters and their brother-in-laws come into the house of God and God saved themselves. A little colt, if you would, got untethered and wasn't afraid to lay out before the Lord. Hallelujah. Not only you, but your whole household be saved. But it takes somebody realizing you've been untethered and loosed for such a time as this. It's your time to be unbridled. It's your time, church. It's your time to step over into the things of God. Because he's using the little donkeys. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Like never before. He goes on to say, all this happened to fulfill the prophecy. It says, tell Zion's daughter, look, your king arrives. He's coming to you full of gentleness. Sitting on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's coat. <laughs> Zechariah 9 9, here's where that prophecy came from. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of the donkey. <laughs> the foal of the donkey. God wants to fulfill prophecy, I believe, again. <laughs> Jesus is coming, and he's riding in on a donkey. He's riding in on your donkey today. When you realize, and you take the place of humility, because you have to be broken and humble to assume the position of a donkey. See, Jesus chose the most stubborn animal in the world to ride in on. <clears throat> Some of y'all just identified and said, I resemble that remark, Pastor. <laughs> I know because <clears throat> I have that trait at times. <laughs> but I'm letting you know, there's nowhere in Scripture where the donkey, even as stubborn as he was, fought back, bucked him, wrestled with him, had to work with him. <clears throat> nowhere it says anything about that. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Let's get here. I got I to gotta get done here. Look here, the two disciples back in Matthew 21. They went ahead and they did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and her colt to him. But look here what they did. They placed their cloaks and their prayer shawls on the donkey. And Jesus wrote it. I started praying about that. <clears throat> Here's some freshness on this, okay? <clears throat> they laid their mantles, <clears throat> their cloaks, their mantles, their outer garments... <laughs> They laid it up on the donkey so that Jesus can ride on it. <clears throat> Did we not find when Elijah's about to go into heaven, Elisha's there, and he says, I want a double portion of what? A double portion of your mantle. The mantle is a representation of the authority of God. The mantle is a representation of the office that God has put in your life. <laughs> the mantle is the representation of your position. If you have one that God's put upon your life. The mantle represents all that thing. But here's the thing you've got to realize. These disciples, these apostles, they had to lay down their titles. They had to lay down their position and authority. They had to lay down anything that would bring them glory. And they had to lay it down and, so that Jesus could ride upon it. But it also says... They placed their prayer shawls on the coat. <laughs> Do you realize they were laying down their prayers? They were giving up their prayers. What do you mean? They were laying down their hopes. They were laying down their dreams, their visions. They were laying down their personal destinies so Jesus could ride on it. What they were doing is surrendering their agendas so that Jesus could ride on it. If we want to see a revival like I've been speaking about, if we want to see a move of God that rocks the nations and the world, you've got to be willing to lay down your titles for towels. You've got to be willing to lay down your dreams, 
lay down your visions. Well, God's told me I've had prophecies, Pastor, of how God was going to do this to me. God, I know He is. But until you're willing to lay that over here on Him and say, you know what? Right now it's just about Jesus riding into town. That's what has to happen first. That's what happens first. So, Lord, today I'm surrendering my agendas. We're surrendering our agendas as this church. We're laying them down at the feet of Jesus, and we're saying, here, let the donkey ride on it. <laughs> let Jesus ride on this donkey. Because, <laughs> Lord, my, I'm worthy of nothing other than just to be the one that packs you into town. <laughs> Amen. What began to manifest then, it says, Then an exceptionally large crowd gathered and carpeted the road with him with their cloaks and their prayer shawls. Can you say it this way? Until leadership was willing to accept the donkey calling. And until leadership was willing to lay down their cloaks, their prayers, their agendas, their things, their hopes and aspirations and say, it ain't about me, it's about you, Jesus. It's about you transferring from this place into town to win souls, to fulfill your destiny. It's about you fulfilling your destiny, God. It's not about me fulfilling mine. Until leadership does it, the large crowds that gather will not do it. And when you have large crowds together, you have so many agendas that everybody wants this, and everybody wants that, and everybody wants this, and they want that, and they want to do this, and want to do that, want to do this, and that. But see, God's bringing us as a body of believers. I can't talk about any other families, but as far as this family, we're laying down our agendas. To take on the agenda of God. <laughs> now you may have said, well, my agenda was Lord all the long. <laughs> yeah, but you had it figured out how your agenda was going to happen. How your destiny was going to manifest. How your purpose was going to come forth. It's because you've been a purpose-driven church. When God says, I ain't trying to create destiny in you. I'm trying to create dynasty in you. I'm trying to bring this something lasting. It's like when we designed this building. <laughs> I didn't design this building what the Lord spoke in my heart and spirit meant Pastor Barb and I. We didn't come forth with this vision of this because uh, that we thought, hey, this is going to be cool for everybody here. We're trying to speak something that after we're dead and gone or going on to be with Jesus, whatever it happens, this place is going to be a house of prayer and a house of worship for generations to come. That's going to keep coming forward. That others are going to come for it. <clears throat> Look what was manifesting here, though. They... The exceptionally large crowd gathered in the road and before him, their cloaks and their prayer shawls laid them out, and they cut down branches from the trees and spread them in his path. <laughs> let me let you in on something here. Your cloak was your outer garment. And I got to thinking about that. <laughs> the Lord brought my spirit. Our outer garments translate that when we remove our outer garments, it places us in a place of humility and transparency. Pointing check here when David escorted the anointing of God the ark of the covenant back into town he was not allowed to wear his kingly attire he said he stripped himself down to his linen ephod he removed his outer garments and he danced before the Lord he said I will become even more undignified than this <laughs> see he tried to do it his way on a new cart, and it cost some people their lives. So Uzzah reached up and tried to, because it looked out of balance, and he reached up and put his hand on it. But I'm here to tell you that just like back in those days, because the Old Testament's the forerunner of the New Testament, and it's a pattern for us to follow, just like David, hallelujah, brought in the power of God, brought in the anointing of God back into the city, and the favor of God back in the city, he didn't do it wearing his kingly attire. He did it when he said, you know what? I'm going to strip off this outer garment. <laughs> David said, you know what? I'm going to take off my preacher suit. And I'm going to come down in my blue jeans and my t-shirt. And I'm going to work with you side by side. 
and we're going to partner together, and we're going to see the glory of God come here. But here's the other thing. We're going to get even more undignified in this because the shouts of glory and Hosanna begin to come forth, hallelujah, as they, Jesus came into town. Why? It was escorting the power, the authority, and the favor of God back into the city, just like David did, hallelujah, when he stripped himself down and he got humbled and broken before God and transparent, hallelujah. He escorted the presence of God and the Ark of the Covenant back in town. That's our goal. Nowhere in Scripture does it say he's going to restore back the tabernacle of Solomon with all of its grandeur and its gold. He doesn't say he's going to uh, restore back the tabernacle of the wilderness that Moses built. But he does say, I'm going to restore back the tabernacle of David. Of David. One so what is he saying? It's not just about 24 hours of praise and worship. It's not about 365 days of worship. It's not just that. It's a tabernacle that we're rebuilding that's full of transparency, full of humility, and it's full of brokenness because it's full of a bunch of donkeys. Yes, your pastor called you a donkey. You notice I'm not reading from the King James today. Check it for yourself. I'm trying to be PG here. <laughs> Hallelujah. You understand? God's looking for a donkey. Look here. at this picture of a donkey. Did you know that every donkey is marked with a cross? Not just a dorsal stripe going, but a vertical one going over the other. Every donkey, no matter what color, has a cross on his back. Because they've been willing They've been called beast of burden for too long, but I'm here to tell you, we're here to carry the cross of Calvary to a lost and dying world. We're here to carry not our agendas, but the agenda of the Lord to a lost and dying world because the problem is churches can't get along with each other and this one's mad at that one and that one's talking about this one. But I'm here to tell you, get over yourself and your agendas and let's be about the Father's business and carry the cross. Be the donkey. Be the donkey. You got time for one more? <coughs> they laid the branches down. <coughs> I've never seen this before. This is Palm Sunday we're celebrating right now. We're celebrating this triumphant entry into Jerusalem here. They cut down the branches. <coughs> and I, I began to pray about this, and this is what the Lord spoke to me. The branches they laid down represent their process of bearing fruit. <coughs> so you can't bear fruit if you don't have a branch. But you can't bear much fruit and your fruit be remaining if you've never been pruned. They were laying down their abilities to win the city. They were laying down their abilities and their agendas of, okay, this is my only way to do this. I've, but you want me to lay it down? We've got to die out to self in order to fulfill what he's called us to do. We've got to die out to our own in, uh, uh, dreams. We've got to die out to the things that we think. <clears throat> but here's the thing you've got to realize. And Barbara and I have been <laughs> praying about this. Some of this, <laughs> God was speaking to, even to her. These branches on a tree, and I, I preached about the branches a few weeks ago. But if these branches are all young branches, they're limber. And they can't hold the weight of the fruit. The Bible interprets the word glory as weightiness, heaviness. I believe God's about to move in revival and there's a glory of God is about to fall and that weightiness that if we've never been in a, had a pruning take place, to strengthen our limbs, to strengthen our branches, we can't handle what God's about to do. We can't contain the glory that's about to be poured out upon us. So it's going to require some pruning. It's going to require you pruning some things. He said, you humble yourself before the Lord. And he will exalt you in due season. You humble yourself before the Lord. You prune those branches. In other words, you break off your own branches that you know are not bearing fruit. Those parts of your life. You break off your own branches of those that you know are not strong enough. And you expose them 
by laying them at the feet of Jesus to let him come into town, to let him come into your house, to let him come into your family, to let him come into your heart. Oh, but pastor, Jesus is in my heart. I've been saved for all these years. I've been saved for 20 years. I've been in the way for 20 years. Yeah, I know. Now it's time to get out of the way. Let him be God. Let him be Lord. Oh, he's been your Savior for a long time. You've had the fire insurance. You've, you've repeated the prayer. But when are we going to have a relationship with him? To realize it's not about me. So therefore today, God, I realize I'm the donkey. And if I'm not even stepping up into my role as a donkey, yet, I've got to realize this. It's time for me, if I'm going to follow the crowd, I'm going to break off some branches in my life and I'm going to lay them down. And I'm going to take my outer garments and become transparent before God and man. I'm going to take down my dreams and, and all those things that I've aspired to try to achieve. And I'm going to say, God, right there it is. There's my career. There's my, my 2.4 kids. There's my American dream. I'm going to lay it down, God. Because you're more important. And what you want to do, not only just in my life and my family, not just what you want to do in my children, not just what you want to do in my church, not just what you want to do in my city or in my county or in my community, but God, what you want to do in the earth is more important and bigger than me. So therefore, God, I lay it down today. I lay it down. I lay it down, Jesus. Praise God. And they spread it in his path. And Jesus rode. In the center of the procession. Crowds going before him. Crowds coming behind him. <clears throat> I believe Todd Hill, that's an evangelistical pattern. When we go and we win souls, we need forerunners to go before us. We need Jesus to be in the center. But then you need the crowds behind the, the follow-ups so that we disciple them and we see them. See <laughs> It's set here. If Jesus is going to bring the glory to town, he needs people going out and saying, hey, come church, come church. We invite you to Jesus. But he's going to need Jesus to be in the center of it when he get here. But then he needs the crowds coming behind him, hallelujah, to disciple and lift them up and to see that no soul is left behind. Nobody falls through the cracks. <laughs> Jesus rode in the center of the procession, crowds going before him, crowds going behind him. And they all shouted, bring the victory, Lord. <laughs> I love that. Hosanna! I preached that last year and everybody started throwing their shoes so I said I better not do it too much. <laughs> Hosanna! Bring the victory! Who does he call him? Son of David. Now we all know that if we read the lineage and I spoke this and released this last week but I'm going to do it again in case you weren't here. The lineage of Jesus that it came from David. But they weren't sitting there, and neither did blind Bartimaeus when he come passing by. He didn't say, Oh, thy great, 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 grandson of David. He said, Son of David. Because he was a son of David. It was birthed from that. And sons become sons become sons. Why? Because God don't have grandchildren. Son of David. Have mercy on me. Do you realize that David, in the midst of all of his sin, I've, I've preached this this way for a long time. I believe David tapped into grace before grace was released. Because David messed up a lot, but you know what? David knew how to repent. He lamented before the Lord, and he wasn't just sorry. He repented. He turned from his sin. But do you realize this? I don't know who this is for, but David was a murderer. David was an adulterer. He was all these things. Yet, because of repentance and grace... It didn't mess up his story. It became a part of his story. And his story continued for a dynasty. Not just his lifetime, not just a destiny, but a dynasty that 23 genealogies later, son of David, he was a man after God's own heart. And so therefore he was so after God's heart that he was still a part of Jesus' story. 23 generations later. But David messed up. David did this and David did that. But David found grace in the eyes and favor in the eyes of God. And because of that, his screw up didn't keep him from being a part of the story. Somebody needs to hear this. 
I don't care where you've been, what you've done, how bad you've messed up. Your screw-up does not disqualify you from the story. It's just, if you repent and turn from it, it becomes a part of the story that God can use to win others to Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Quickly right here. He comes with the blessings and being sent from the Lord Yahweh. We celebrate with praises to God in the highest. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the people went wild with excitement. <laughs> I like that. They went wild with excitement, and the whole entire city was thrown in an uproar. <laughs> the city was thrown in an uproar. <clears throat> I'm here to tell you, when Jesus comes to town, it changes things. <laughs> And everybody's like, well, Jesus has been here. There are so many churches. I ain't talking about churches. I ain't talking about religion. I'm talking about God showing up and showing out. I'm talking about something, some precedent. I'm talking about something you can't dream up or you can't drum up. Amen. I'm not talking about a man or an individual or, or a, a group of people or a church. Or, I'm talking about Jesus. When people, Christians, the family decides it ain't about them. It's about Daddy God, Yahweh. It's not your way, it's not my way, it's Yahweh. <laughs> then all of a sudden we usher in the things of the Spirit. We usher into the point that the city becomes in an uproar. Hallelujah. And people going wild with excitement. Some ask, who is this man? And the crowd shouted back, this is Jesus. He's the prophet of Galilee. So I propose to you today something. People ask Pastor Barb and I this all the time. We got our barbecue booth set up or something like that. They say, what is going on? How's all these people coming in? We see you ever. You're already, how does all these things happen? Here's your answer in this scripture. This is Jesus. Don't point him to the church. Don't point him to the pastor. Point him to Jesus. You understand? Somebody, how is this happening? Because this is Jesus. The whole town's in uproar and talking about the, see, everybody's talking about a building. It ain't got nothing to do with this building. It's got to do with the Jesus in this building. <laughs> this is Jesus. Oh, we love how you preach there. We love how Pastor Barb sings. It's not about this or her. It's about this is Jesus in us. If there's any good coming out, this is Jesus. If you see anything that's of value, this is Jesus. If you see anything that's of worth, this is Jesus. If you're blessed, it was Jesus. You understand? Point to Him in everything you do. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You for Your Word. You said it doesn't return void, but it accomplishes what it's sent to do and is pleasing in Your sight. God, I ask You for that Word to manifest even today. With heads bowed and eyes closed, this is a new day. Hallelujah. This is a new way. There's a new anointing of God is being released today. Lord, we didn't come here with a preconceived idea of who or what you were going to be and what you were going to do. But, Lord, we present to you new wineskin to you expand us like you want to. So I'm asking right now, Father God, that you stir up the spirits of men and women of God. Right now, there's no accidents why anybody's here. You're here for a purpose. You're here for us to point you to Jesus. And if you've never known Jesus, we want to point you there. We don't want you just repeating prayers. We want you to have an encounter with Him. So if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, would you lift up your hand and say, I need, I need some prayer today, Pastor. I need some change in my life. Maybe you're here and you don't know Him. Or maybe you're here and you have known Him. But yet you know you're drawn away. And you know you're not where you need to be with God today. You know you're not in that place with the Lord. You know you're not in that place that you have a daily encounter. And you're struggling with your walk. And you're struggling with living right before the Lord. And you're trying to do it all you can. But it's time to give up. Quit struggling and surrender totally to Him. And just say, Lord, here it is. But if you're struggling with your walk with God. And you want some change in your life. And you need prayer today. Would you lift up your hand? 
Yes, hands sees that hands are going up all over. Come on, be honest with God. Hands are going up all over the place. Come on, keep them up. Keep them. <laughs> more of it. See, the thing is, some of you need to realize something. You're not here by accident. We say, come as you are, you won't leave the same. We believe that. Don't leave here the same way you came. Are you ready for change? Are you ready for change? In just a second, we're going to stand to our feet. And when we do, I want everybody, as you stand, everybody that lifted your hand, or even if you didn't lift your hand and you need a touch from God today, I want you to make your way down to this altar as quickly as you can. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let's stand up. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. All of you. Don't leave here the same way. There's a brand new altar about to be released here. A brand new anointing. Hallelujah.